So I'm, I'm really excited uh, to be discussing today with Drs. Aviva Aiden and Per Adastra about their recent lab protocol article published in PLOS One entitled A Rapid, Low Cost, and Highly Sensitive SARS-CoV-2 Diagnostic Based on Whole Genome Sequencing and the associated protocol in protocols.io. Avi Vamper, thank you so much for uh, being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Aviva Aiden is an assistant professor of pediatric and molecular and human genetics at Texas Children's Hospital and the Baylor College of Medicine. She completed her PhD and MD at Harvard, followed by medical training in pediatrics Global Child Health and Neonatology at Texas Children's Hospital and Stanford University School of Medicine. Over the last five years, Dr. Aiden has also practiced as, as the world's northernmost pediatrician in Utkiavik, Alaska. Her work focuses on the genomics of disease vectors sequencing-based approaches to infectious disease diagnostics and genomics of indigenous people of Alaska and the conditions that disproportionately affect them. Dr. Peradastra is a clinical metagenomics fellow at Texas Children's Microbiome Center in Houston, Texas. He focuses on developing infection disease diagnostics and producing quality reference genomes for pathogens specific to the patient population at Texas Children's. Before his current fellowship, Per was a Howard Hughes Gilliam Fellow at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, where he completed his doctoral research under the mentorship of Aviva and Eris Aiden in the Department of Genetics and Genomics. The protocol we will be discussing today is a result of his doctoral research, which also focused on developing novel infection disease diagnostics. Before these, Per obtained his bachelor's in biophysics and biochemistry at the University of Houston. During this time, Per first entered the field of research related to human health and disease as a recipient of a summer undergraduate research fellowship to study virulence factors and a frontier in science fellowship to develop methods for assembling genomes from probiotics. Again, Avivan Per, thank you so much for being with us. And to kick it off, uh, can you briefly explain either of you what the protocol is about, how to use it, and why it is relevant? Uh, I can start off. Um, so the protocol is for pathogen-oriented low-cost assembling and resequencing, or what we call POLAR. And as the name of the method suggests, it's a low-cost, high-throughput method for diagnosing infections like COVID um, using a genome-wide amplification step followed by sequencing. Um, this protocol is developed or, you know, and released via preprint uh, about three months into the pandemic. So a lot of this is sort of hindsight is 2020. Um, so beyond the immediate relevance of needing a low cost high throughput diagnostic for met for diagnosing COVID so early in our pandemic, um, at that time we were already sort of thinking forward in the future about how, you know, beyond providing a yes, no, a sequencing based diagnostic would be able to capture genomic information about the virus in real time that would be useful for, you know, what could be possible, but we also now know is true, which is surveillance tracking. Um, so that is what the protocol is and why it is relevant or and, was relevant. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, the motivations for developing this protocol were pretty clear at the time. Uh, but you said that you pre-printed the protocol very soon, you know, after the lockdown. So my 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 question is, uh, what, what, what were you working before that allow you to very rapidly respond to this pandemic? Well, uh, most of my, you know, pre-COVID research with Aviva, we had, you know, Aviva works on infectious disease diagnostics, uh, you know, so she was, you know, advising me on this. And so a lot of my work prior to that was still related to developing infectious disease diagnostics. And at the time, 
you know, we were trying to develop methods for diagnosing bacterial infections, you know, any kind of bacterial infection, um, and an essay based around that. And so whenever the pandemic happened, it really became necessary to only diagnose one particular infection. So, you know, sort of combination of right place, right time, we already had a lot of the knowledge and toolkits at our disposal that we would immediately then shift for the development of polar. Um, so, you know, we quickly just shifted and responded to kind of what the market needed, which was, you know, a very uh, specific test. But that's kind of why it was so easy for us to pivot from, you know, what we were working on before to what was then needed and what we developed. And I'll just, I'll just add on to that. I know Paris is, is describing this as something that was just very obvious and easy pivoting. And, um, you know, this is, the, the work is really a testament to his um, uh, flexibility and skill and um, creativity. And it, you know, yes, he was absolutely working on, on some of these techniques um, beforehand, a lot of these techniques beforehand, but it's a, it's a very different problem. And, uh, and the fact that he was able to pivot so effectively so quickly is really also a testament to his, to his, to his talent and skill. So I, I, I completely agree with everything you say, except how easy and obvious it was. Well, I, I will also add what also made that really easy is that particularly, you know, Aries and Viva are very supportive of like anything, you know, I've wanted to <laughs> <laughs> So that's also, you know, that there's no one telling me no, stop. So that, you know, that's that, but that's also a reason why I was easy to do because I had really good advisors that were like, oh, you have this idea. Yeah, go, you know, try it. And so that during my entire uh, dissertation work, there, that was always something I loved about my mentorship there. But, you know, that's just to add on to that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and in addition of how important was or is to have a robust diagnostic tool during a pandemic, but to help us understand the differentiator, can you uh, describe a little bit what was the state of the art in terms of diagnostic at the point and why you know this protocol stands out? Uh, well, at the state of, at the state of our state of the art at the time, uh, there was only fifty seven approved diagnostics from the FDA. Now there's over at least three hundred. Um, the standard, the gold standard then was basically RT PCR. So all of the diagnostics were RT PCR based, which is a method that amplifies a very small but unique portion of the viral genome. Um, so that was a very that was sort of the state of the art. Um, there were people that were looking at ways of doing genome, whole genome amplification to study sort of variants and track variants of the virus at the time, but none of those methods at the time, particularly those ones developed by like the Arctic Network and Joshua Quick, who actually developed the primer library we ended up using, uh, were using a platform that would provide a cost-effective and high-throughput way of sort of deploying this kind of diagnostic. Um, so that's kind of how this particular method stands out both from, you know, available diagnostics at the time that uh, were FDA emergency youth authorized approved, as well as, you know, similar protocols on sort of more, more research level uh, that, you know, kind of do, you know, the idea of surveillance tracking through whole genome application. This is what I would say is how is what kind of distinguishes this protocol from those others. And I'll just I'll just contextualize that a little bit clinically because I was doing a lot of clinical work um, in the early months of the pandemic, as well. Um, just because there was significant need. This is a time when you know you would have like you know a, a small bin with a couple of tests that you know you might get back today maybe. Um, and there was there was a desperate need. You know people are crowding into the you know ERs are very early on looking for testing. Um, obviously people wanted to know physicians in the in the ER and they in the hospitals and ICUs want us to know what they were treating so they could be most effective um, and they can prevent spread. And um, there was a desperate, desperate need clinically for high throughput methods. And, and um, this was another impetus for um, PAIR's work was that this, is, this was desperately needed clinically. Um, and there just wasn't, even though there were 57 tests at the time, that just there was not availability of high throughput testing. Um, even though technically there were some approvals um, and some tests that were val validated. And, you know, I remember that the protocol, it's highly sensitive, so you can detect down to around 80 genomes per milliliter, and probably you need about uh, 1,000 more to be able to complete the genome sequencing. Uh, how 
do those quantities relate to the acuteness of the disease? So are you, so uh, is the question basically is the question relating to what is the relationship to viral load exactly. and uh, yes to, to viral load. yeah so this is a really great question um, I think there's not a great answer just because it's a very it's probably a variant specific question because you know basically as the virus has changed over time the symptom profile change has changed in just in general with the virus and then um you know we for example know actually that people were most infectious just at or during the onset of symptoms and so in that way you know the symptoms and uh, viral load actually do correlate more or less well but in terms of you know when the viral load is you know x people have symptoms i think it's a little bit more unclear because also then you can think too about you know we not only have different symptoms in terms of just sort of, you know, cough versus sneezing versus sore throat versus body ache. You can then think of people who have long COVID, you know, like who, you know, presumably are still testing positive and their viral loads might also be fluctuating. Um, so I don't have a great answer to that because I just think it's a very difficult thing to look at that I think a lot of other researchers have done, but it's also just been changing over time relative to the virus. Maybe Aviva has a better answer than I do as someone who's really more clinically focused or in the clinical act, actually. Yeah, so I honestly, I, I, I confess, I don't know of a particular correlation between viral load and, and severity of illness. Um, uh, again, there may be people who've studied this more carefully in a research context, but um, uh, it's not something that, that I personally dealt with clinically at all. I see, thank you. And now, like going back to the protocol and digging a little bit more into the details for the user, what are the most critical steps of the protocol? I think the most critical step particularly is the genome-wide amplification step, um, because this is where a lot of the essay gets its strength from in terms of its ability to provide genome-wide information about you know, the virus, but also like the sensitivity of the virus, because a good way to think about polar um, is that it's just like a highly multiplex RT-PCR essay. Um, like I said earlier, RT-PCR based essays look at a very, you know, only a few or one particular region of a, of a you know, target. Polar is basically doing that 400 times or 200 times uh, because of the 400 amplicons that we generate. Um, so that's one of the, you know, that's like one of the most critical steps because it's one, of, it's a, it's a crucial step in sort of the overall design of the essay and where a lot of the sort of power comes from the essay. And while you were developing the protocol. Was there anything that you tried that you thought it was intuitive, but didn't work at the end and didn't make it to the final version? Uh, I, uh, intuitive, no. Uh, there were definitely a lot of things that we chased after. Um, particularly one that comes to mind is extraction-free variants of our protocol, which were all the rage at the time. Um, you know, obviously there is, you know, during this time that we all lived in, in, you know, research, there was things running out of supply all the time. One of those being, you know, the method or the materials necessary to collect samples from people. You know, so extraction free is not only attractive because, you know, it's less plastic, less wasteful, but also re reflects the fact that those things are just not yeah, available. Yeah. Therefore, yeah, and then therefore removes the barrier to diagnostic testing at some level. And so we really chased after and spent a lot of cycles on trying to adapt our method uh, to be sort of a extraction free approach where we put basically either uh, you know, a fraction of a mid-turbinate swab sample and or saliva, or not and or, but or saliva, because we also tried to, we tried developing the method on saliva for a very long time uh, as a fraction-free approach. Um, but that never really panned out well for us in the end. Um, despite other people's success with that same sort of approach, we never really got it to work for us. That's definitely something we tried and it just, it just never worked for us. And it was, you know, something we really wanted so very quickly after the pandemic, you were able to preprint the, the protocol, but then you took it one step further and you decide to send it for peer review. What was the motivation to have this formally peer reviewed and eventually appeared as a indexed publication? 
I think a lot of the, the motivation is, um, I mean, the method, while it, very valuable as a diagnostic, was also more broadly applicable um, to other approaches. And so I think having it um, in the established literature is a value add to science. And so I think that that was kind of our motivation to do that. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's good professionally to um, have things um, peer reviewed and and also we got a lot of really helpful feedback to improve um, improve the approach uh, and uh, the presentation of the approach and other validation that they that was recommended and, and that's some that's one of the advantages of peer review in general so um, certainly we wanted it out there as quickly as possible um, because there was a significant need but ultimately I think that um, long term it's it's it will be of greater value to everybody uh, since it's in a peer-reviewed context. And I would like to build up on, on that, um, on your, you know, last series of comments. Can you elaborate either of you on, on, on the feedback that you received and how it shaped the final version of the protocol from the peer reviewer, the feedback that you received? So I'll say, I think the peer review um, was less about, um, I, I think that the, peer review of the protocol itself was very positive. Uh, I think that there were some uh, suggestions about how best to present it, how best to present the data. There, was a lot, there were a lot of questions about general applicability um, and validation, but in terms of the protocol itself, everyone was very favorably disposed. And I, 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 this is also a long time. I actually ended up, um, because the preprint had been around, or well, the protocol had been around for a while, um, before it was finally uh, published as a lab protocol. Uh, definitely, I think it was absolutely right about the idea about you know, peer review is absolutely necessary. I think we were obviously given the, the situation, the exigency of that kind of information that we had developed this protocol, that's why we definitely put it on by archive, you know, without you know, sort of bypassing peer review, but we ultimately did want to get it you know, reviewed. Um, I ended up meeting, you know, there, so it was online for a bit and then it was actually already being cited. Um, and so I was actually able to get in contact with some of the authors who actually had been using our method and kind of asked them about, you know, how they'd used our protocol IO, actually getting some clarification about, you know, where certain, you know, where certain steps, you know, me as writing something might come off to someone else is not, you know, what I think I'm saying, you know, because communication as humans is difficult um, and that it is not limited to, you know, the written word. And so that was, you know, in general, yeah, there were some things with peer review that came up where it was like clarifications on here and there about how it can be misconstrued. And that also sort of came up with my, these sort of one-on-one -on -one meetings I had with uh, other researchers. Who Users. Had yeah. Um, and some would reference, you know, looking at the protocol IO, which is like a very nice formatted bulleted list of steps. It's cross compared to like, you know, the paper and various data points as well as the method section within our paper. Um, so that was something, you know, in terms of delimiting, like, what is meant by this and that, I think is something that I came up during peer review, which also had come up with sort of these one-on-one -on -one meetings I was having with people. And Avia, uh, you mentioned that, you know, there is certain general appeal or, or that, that the protocol could be generalized or extended. Could you please elaborate on, on what you mean by that? Like, be, is it beyond diagnostics or how do you see the protocol being generalized? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, as I, there were some examples in uh, specifically in the paper of using it more broadly in viral contexts, um, but, um, but in general, the approach of, of um, this, for, this, uh, um, this approach to sequencing um, can be applied um, in other contexts outside of just even just e e certainly broadly in virology, but in other contexts as well. I see. So it can be easily pivot to other viruses, for example. And and Pear showed that in the paper itself. Um, certainly, I think that there's, you know, people have um, brought up the possibility of approaching this, of using this approach for other commonly tested for viruses. Flu is something that's come up a lot. RSV is something that's come up a lot. Um, you know, adenovirus, et cetera. There's a number of very common viruses that you see in clinical settings and that people have kind of suggest, made suggestions um, about utilizing the method in those contexts and specifically because of its very um, uh, impressive kind of data production that you don't see in other, um, in other types of testing that, is co that are commonly done in clinical settings. And the last question that I have is, you know, you, you mentioned 
that it is professionally important to have a peer reviewed publication. So I know that the protocol, the, the paper is relatively young, but can you can you say or speculate what has been the significance of having this paper published for both of your careers, considering the different stages in which you are? I think it's it's a little hard to say. Um, I think in general, um, if you're if you're in academics at least. Um, you know, it is helpful to show that you are scientifically productive, and um, that's often measured. It, there are several metrics, but one of them is, you know, have you published papers that the scientific community thinks are um, valid, valuable, original, etc. And so, you know, I, I think it's, you know, time will tell, but um, I think it's, it's a piece of work that, you know, we're very proud of. And um, I think that that's, you know, a lot of the reward, honestly. And for you, I also, yeah, I, I also agree. I think in, in general, um, you know, my current fellowship was uh, geared towards those who wanted to develop diagnostics. So it definitely was you know, necessary and great, very relevant sort of resume to have for the particular fellowship that I applied for and over received. Um, you know, I did get a little bit of scrutiny the fact that it wasn't published because yeah you know it is seen as in academia that you know, we are measured by our publications at some level um so you know having it ultimately published is, is valid is very validating just to kind of have to get that last step and done all of the steps that are necessary you know to finally get something out there such that you know formal canon of sort of scientific literature at this point or you know not just but like you know it's in a published paper accepted versus something on bioarchive um yeah, I would say that. And so, and before we finish, is there anything that you would like to mention that we haven't touched so far in the conversation? I personally can't think of anything. Evo, can you can you think of? No, I, I think it was it was it was. I'll just say it was it was a, a pleasure and honor to work with Pear on this project, and I think he did amazing work. And I'm glad that that it came to this this um, successful successful endpoint. Well, thank you both so much, really, for having this opportunity to to talk to me. I know that you're busy. So I do appreciate the, the time to share your thoughts and, and more details about the protocol and you know what didn't work and what steps are, are tricky. I think that information will be useful for the users. Well, thank you very much for having us. We really appreciate it.